Well, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk about the influence of the European culture in our music. You know, we are a grand country. It means that uh, our culture is, uh, the, let's say, the product of the syncretism of uh, several different cultures. Uh, there were several different uh, tribes or ethnicities coming to our country from the 16th century and on up to the 19th century. You know that Cuba was one of the last countries that eliminated or abolished slavery. And um, from Spain, basically, and also from France, and also from different parts of Europe, came to our country different people. The mix of all of these cultures is the Cuban culture. But today we are going to talk a tiny bit more about the influence of uh, Europe in our culture. Basically, we're going to talk about Spain. There was an influence also of the French people that came to our country after the French Revolution, I mean the Haitian Revolution. There were many people coming to the eastern part of the island. But basically, the people came from Spain, the most of them. Even there's something that's not really well known. During the first half of the 20th century, because, uh, you know, during the 19th century, because of the expansion of the business of the sugar mills, they brought a lot of black guys, basically from Congo, from the Bantu area of Africa. So there was a moment that they were afraid of uh, so many blacks could uh, start a revolution in the same way as in Haiti. So even during the 20th century, there were a lot of black guys coming from Spain. Even during the 20th century, in order to, uh, I don't know what's the word in English, but uh, make uh, a little bit more uh, light-skinned the Cuban population. Well, basically from the 16th century, there were people coming to our island. Uh, the most of the guys were military. Uh, but also came uh, people from different families. Basically, the immigration came from what we call Castilla and Andalusia. Castilla la Vieja, Castilla la Nueva. You can see there Castilla and León, and then the southern part of uh, Spain, which is Andalusia. But from the 17th century on, there were some people also in forms of families coming from Canary Island. What happened? That Canary Island was one of the ports that they touched in the uh, movement from Europe to, to Cuba. So there was one main port in Spain, which was Sevilla in the southern part of Spain. Then from Sevilla, they used to go to Canary Island and they touched Lanzarote, Gran Canaria. And then from there, they came to our island. So they most, uh, the basic influence in terms of music in our country came from the people of Andalusia instead of Canary Island. We know that because the Punto Cubano, which is one of the styles or one of the genres that we do have in the, let's say, Spanish influenced music in our country, in Canary Island it's called Punto Cubano. It's not called, it doesn't have another name. So we know that the, the music came basically came basically from uh, southern Spain and from the Castillas, especially from southern Spain, because uh, they did have a couple of styles that were uh, very uh, important in our country. In the Punto Cubano, there's one style which is influenced by uh, a kind of music that we call fandango. Fandango was the music of the period in, in Spain. And uh, there were a couple of composers. One of them uh, was Padre Soler, Father Soler, a great uh, Spanish composer. The other, was, the other one was Italian, Scarlatti, the Baroque music of the period. And they played they basically 
performed in the Fandango, a kind of music in minor keys or minor mode, which is very near to one of the styles that we do have in our country, which is called La Tonada Menor. The difference is the Fandangos are in different keys. Some of them are in E minor, some of them in D minor. Basically, our Punto Cubano in the style of the Tonada Menor is in D minor, but sometimes in E minor. So this is the basic difference, but uh, you're going to listen right now to uh, a fragment because I don't have time to talk everything that I would like to here in the conference. We don't have time enough, and this is a long subject. So this is the Fandango played by John, John Rondeau, which is a, a French uh, musician playing the Fandango of Father Soler. There's one thing that I would like that you listen to. It's a ternary pattern, right? See, it is ternary. In our music, there's some, there are some changes for this kind of music, but Fandango is basically the same kind of music of uh, the Tonada Menor. And you, you can listen as well, the sound of Andalusia the sound of the south of Spain, which is the most beautiful part of that country. Listen to me. This is an incredible musician. He plays really good. Well, uh, in the Cuban music, in terms of the influence of Europe, uh, we do have two uh, different styles of complexes. You know, for some people, some, some people don't like the, the, our, let's say, uh, use of the word complexes. Because, of course, some of the music of some genres that we include in one complex apparently has have nothing in common with the, the rest of the music. But I prefer to use the, the term complex, which is a term that was used for, by one of our greatest uh, musicologists and an ethnologist during the beginning of the the times of the beginning of the revolution during the 60s. I'm talking about Algeliers Leon. So we do have two complexes. One of them is Complejo del Punto Cubano, the Punto Cubano complex. And in the Punto Cubano complex, we do have the tonada menor that we were talking about before. We do have the Punto Libre. We do have the, with the different variants of the Punto Libre, and uh, we, ha we have the dance, which is the zapateo. And uh, we have the punto fijo, punto corrido, and different styles of punto. And then we have the Cuban song complex, which is the, the, the Cuban song that started about the 19th century in our country, and even before, perhaps. And uh, that has certain, let's say, spirit of Creole, spirit, besides the influence of uh, Europe. Well, in terms of the background of this uh, music, the Punto Cubano, which is the first one that we're going to approach, uh, we do have the, write, the written Spanish poetry. You know, Spain is a country of poets, and uh, we use and special kind of stanza for our uh, Punto Cubano, 
which is called decima. Decima are stanzas of 10 verses that the rhyme is going to be A, B, B, A, then A, C, then C, D, D, C. This is the style of the, of the decima. Then we have also the ancestral tradition of the oral poetry, which is coming from the beginnings of the, uh, let's say, Western civilization in, uh, in the world. We do have the universal and Spanish tradition of the controversy between poets. I don't know if here in America you have something similar, but all over Latin America, we do have this kind of style of controversy, which is coming basically from Spain and was used also in, uh, in the southern part, let's say, of the uh, Europe. I'm talking about France, I'm talking about Italy, but basically in Spain. In Spain there's a, a tradition of the controversy which are a kind of a fraternal struggle between a couple of poets. They uh, start improvising because everything is improvised and they are unbelievable. They start to improvise when someone is losing, then in Cuba, for example, they start, uh, I don't know, singing decimas from uh, Vicente Pinel or from uh, Calderón de la Barca or from, uh, I don't know, any of the poets of the golden century. I don't know if this is the word that you use for the, for the period in Spain. We call it the golden century, which is the, from mid 1500s to mid 1600s. So when someone is losing, so start instead of improvising, singing the music of uh, the, the poetry of all, any of these uh, great poets of the, of the period. And then we have one main influence in musical terms, which is the Trovo al Pujareño and the Fandango. You're going to listen to Trovo al Pujareño. There's a difference between Trovo al Pujareño and our style for uh, improvising the uh, the Punto Cubano. Trovo Pujareño is performed in five verses stanzas instead of ten. The, the, the rhyme is A, B, B, A, and then A again. Sometimes A, B, C, B, A. All depends on the kind of poet and depends on the, of the region of Spain. There are, there are uh, Trovo in uh, Alpujarra, the region of Alpujarra in southern Spain. And there's also Trovo in Murcia. The Trovo in Murcia is different. Even some uh, ethnicities. You know that Spain is a multi-tribal country. In fact, Spain is about four, five, let's say five different countries. Absolutely different. If you go to north, they are absolutely different than in the south. I prefer the south because they are nearer to us in cultural terms. So, this is the, uh, the situation. And then, in terms of the origins of the Punto Cubano in our country, we do have first the emer emergency of a peasantry in our country. Uh, normally, the people with more money, they take the better lands and there were people with more money that took the better lands. And then the poorer people uh, had to move deep country. I don't know if this is the word or if this is the phrase. They moved deep country, so emerged a peasantry based on Spanish people. But at the same time, you have to remember that when we were talking about the Indians and the black guys in our country, many of the Indians became Maroons and they went to the countryside as well in order to hide of Spanish people. And many black guys did the same. So, in spite of the uh, Punto Cubano is basically Spanish music, or is, uh, it does have uh, uh, a very important influence of the uh, Spanish music, is brown music at the same time. We're going to talk about the instruments that are used, and we do use a lot of instruments of African origins for performing the Punto Cubano. The second, uh, the second thing that I didn't talk about before is uh, that these guys were 
Creolicizing, I don't know if this is the word, the word became becoming Creoles, both the Africans and Spanish people and also the Indians. So the layer of the society that emerged in these uh, areas of the, of the uh, country, outside of the cities, was a mixed and Creole layer of the society. This is a Punto Cubano. In the Punto Cubano, uh, of course, we do have different styles. There are different styles of Punto Cubano. And uh, I'm going to play right now just a fragment of Troa Pujaneño, and then I'm going to play Punto Cubano, and you are going to see that they are basically very similar. This is the Trova Pujareño. I'm going to play just a fragment. You are going to know that's very flamenco. There's, you can listen the spirit of, let's say, the Arabs when they were there. You know, Spain uh, became free of the Arabs in 14, about 1492, just at the end of the century. So uh, the influence of the Arabs in the Spanish music is huge. So you are going to listen, it's going to sound like flamenco, but you are going to note that they are using a five verses stanzas. There's one more thing that I have to say. They are not singers. They are popular people. And what's important in this kind of music, even in Punto Cubano, is what you are saying. Let's say that's something similar to hip hop. With the difference that in uh, hip hop, they normally try to rhyme the verses, but sometimes they don't take a, a lot of care of the structure of the sentences. Meanwhile, in Punto Cubano uh, and in Troa Pujareño, all verses should have the same uh, amount of syllables. Syllables? Is that okay? Syllables. All right. Okay. So that's their point. Here we go. You see that they repeat this, the, the first verse just to think about what they're going to say, they're improvising. Out of tune, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I love it. How do you like it? It's nice, eh? They are not singers. It doesn't matter if they are out of tune. What's important is how they can uh, structure and stanza of five verses uh, correctly done and with spirit and with this spirit of struggling that uh, belongs to the controversy. Well, the Punto Cubano the Punto Cubano has, uh, let's say, uh, certain characteristics. The first one is the use of a decima that I was talking about that. Decima are 10 versus stanzas. 
This is the first uh, uh, thing. Then, the decima is sung in a musical period that we call tonada. And this, there's one important thing. The tonadas are different in every part of our country. Uh, Alejo Carpentier, who was uh, one of the greatest uh, Cuban uh, novelists and intellectuals, even he wrote the, perhaps the first uh, history of the music in Cuba. He said that the music of the peasantry in our country was boring because the, the melody is basically the same. But he never was uh, everywhere in Cuba. Basically, he was living in France. He was in France for a long time. Of course, he, he lived also in Havana. But uh, the, the, the tonada, of course, is not uh, like a, a ballad or like a son montuno or like rock and roll or, or styles of music. But uh, the, the tonadas change with, from one part of the island to the other one. The third aspect is the use of emiola. We call emiola, I don't know if emiola is correct, emiola. We call it emiola in uh, Spanish, emiola should be. Emiola is the alternance of a 6-8 signature with a 3-4, which is this. And this is the Punto Cubano. This is the, the let's say, the, the, the style that we use for playing. If you listen, it's a pattern of two bars, which is very characteristic of the African music. But we have to remember that the Arabs were in, uh, in Spain for a long time. And the Emiola is coming from the Arabs. If you listen to the music of the Arabs, they sing long poets, long, uh, long, long poems, in, uh, using the Maila in different parts of the Arab world. And then the last thing is the use of a plucked chordophone instrument, which could be either a tres or any instrument of the family of the Uds. And the Uds are coming also from the Arab world. This is a decima written by a, an, a, an American intellectual. I know that your verses are different, your poetry is absolutely different, but he tried to write a decima using your language. Of course, this is not high quality poetry. It's not T.S. Eliot or Walt Whitman or, uh, I don't know, Carl Sander or uh, Hughes, but it's poetry. You can see the rhymes. Pastranic has been in our country several times, and he loves the, the countryside music. He loves the countryside, but he's unbelievable. He, he, his daughter is a very good singer. His daughter looks to be Latin. Uh, I don't know, uh, perhaps his wife uh, is Cuban or Puerto Rican or from somewhere in, uh, in Latin America, but the look of the lady, the young lady, I don't have her here, but I do have a video. Uh, she's singing, uh, uh, and then we have the dance for the Guajiros. The dance of the Guajiros is called Zapateo. Zapateo, uh, as every dance coming from Spain, and also the dance coming from Africa, is basically a courtship dance, where uh, the, the, the man is like uh, the pigeon, and the lady is like uh, the dove, and the pigeon is trying to get the dove which is the same thing that happens in the world from the beginning of the times. So this is the Zapateo. Zapateo is uh, it's not in use in our country anymore. Nobody dances Zapateo, even in the countryside. They dance to uh, rock and roll, hip hop, and this kind of music, even the, the peasantry, because, uh, you know, times changes. But uh, in the performances, let's say public performances at theaters and this kind of uh, performances, we can have a look to Zapateo. I do have an example. Very quickly, I'm going to play a fragment of a Zapateo. This is a performance in a theater. It wasn't like this in the old times. Say it a 
looks very, very Yucatec, very Mexican. It's the same country. It's the same country. Basically, all Latin America is the same country. It's the same thing. And it looks a lot also like the, the dances in uh, Venezuela. Colombia. Colombia. So we are the same country. Latin America is basically the same country. Uh, thanks God we are not like Africa. Well, all, all of these guys uh, made Africa a, country, uh, a continent of square countries because they divided the country in the in function of their interests. All the capitalism, uh, unfortunately, square countries. But uh, Latin America, we are different, and we do have the same heritage: African, Indian, and Spanish, and uh, European, of course. There are a lot of uh, people from different, uh, let's say, in uh, Southern America. There are a lot of people with uh, German origins, but and um, Italian, let's say, Argentina or. Uruguay, but basically uh, the whole Caribbean is the same, and in Mexico, uh, Mexico is uh, Mexico is my country in certain sense. I love Mexico. Well, ladies and gentlemen, these are the instruments that are used in the in the punto cubano. As you can see, we use the clave, and the clave is playing this pattern, and then we have the widow, and the widow plays like this. I like to play a uh, counterpoint and I do something like this. And no, it's uh, doing a counterpoint. That, that, that's my style. I, I play the 6 8 this way. But uh, you know, it's a myla. It's 1 6 8 and 1 3 4. And then we have the, the, the chordophones. We normally use a, a lute, or we can use a guitar, or we can use a tres. So in certain parts of the country, for example, the central part of the country, they use much more the tres instead of a lute. Lute is much more for the western side of the, of the, of the island. And there's something important that I have to tell you. Actually, we didn't have Punto Cubano in the eastern side of the island. I don't know exactly why, but uh, basically the people that came to our country, they went to the uh, western side of the country and the central part. So we do have very important punto in the central part of the island, which is called Punto Fijo, Parranda Espirituana, and uh, Punto eh, Corrido, o cru perdón, Punto Cruzado, Meanwhile, in the western part of the island, we do have Seguidilla and Punto eh, Libre. But in the same way that we didn't, perhaps, we didn't have Son Montuno in the western part of the island, in the eastern part of the island, I'm talking about Oriente, I'm talking about Baracoa, all of this region, we didn't have Rumba and we didn't have Punto Cubano, not developed like in the in the other parts of the of the countries. And well, these are the instruments. Uh, we do use a double bass. At the beginning, we used uh, the African instrument called marimbula that we've talked about that before. And we have the bongo. The bongo plays a pattern. And then the look. And then starts the, the poet. So we're going to talk about the punto occidental. We call western punto. Punto occidental is the punto of the uh, western side uh, of the island. Uh, there we have the punto libre. Punto libre means that the poet is free. So he starts singing, normally they sing a couple of verses, A and B. 
And then, well, there's an introduction. And then, after the introduction, the poet sings A and B. Two verses of the ten verses stanza of the decima. Then, there's a, a kind of interlude. Boom, 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 boom. And then he sings A, B, B, A. And then there's one more interlude because he has to, th to think about what he's going to, to keep improvising. This is something difficult. And I'm a sonero. I'm very uh, good improvising. And I tell you that improvising in, the, in, the, in this kind of style, using the same amount of, uh, let's say, syllabus in each verse is difficult. And we do have the same things in the rest of Latin America. Basically, we use the, the decima, which is, was invented during the golden century by Vicente Spinel, or was used first by Vicente Spinel. So we do have this kind of uh, punto uh, fijo. In the punto fijo, the poet can't stop the music whenever he wants. Uh, I mean, uh, punto libre, I'm sorry. Punto libre, he can't stop whenever he wants he can't stop the music and then start improvising. Whenever the idea comes, he stopped the, 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 the musicians, I mean, the background, and then he kept uh, singing. Normally he sings A, B, then A, B, B, A, then A, C, and then C, D, D, C. Sometimes they sing C, A instead of A, C. All depends on the poet, all depends on the, the region. The other style that we do have there is the tonada menor, or tonada Carvajal. It's called Carvajal because there was a, a great poet called Carvajal in the 19th century. And this kind of tonada is in minor mode, basically E minor, sometimes D minor, all depends on the, uh, the singer. And then uh, tonada, this is the tonada menor. And then we have seguidilla. Seguidilla, normally they sing one quatrain, sometimes one decima, in the normal style of the punto libre, and then they start singing, improvising, verse by verse, verse by verse, verse by verse, they can be for half an hour, sometimes for one hour. I have seen a, a guy called Alexis Lia Pimienta, I'm going to play uh, just um, a small uh, excerpt of Alexis Dia Pimienta singing Seguiria. The Seguiria in the past, there was a guy called Chanito Isidron. I have heard that he was the best, number one. But I wasn't alive at that time. Unfortunately, I never had the chance to see Chanito singing. This is... This is Punto Libre. This is the interlude. A, B. B, A. All right. A, C. CD. DC. This is a decimal. You see, he's interrupting the, the interlude. He, he doesn't mind. For you that speak Spanish, uh, they are unbelievable. Unfortunately, I didn't have the chance because normally I have to disturb a friend of mine for my translations and I couldn't make it. Uh, I translated myself with my poor English a couple of things uh, that you are going to, to see in the, in the future. Now you are going to listen to my favorite poet, 
she is a, a blind lady, Tomasita Kiala. She's going to sing uh, a tonada menor, but instead of E minor, it's going to use D minor. I know, sorry. Cuando canto el menor y este punto lo mantengo. Cuando canto el menor y este punto lo mantengo. Lo hago cada vez que tengo alguna pena de amor. Soy la hija del dolor, fui por la pena parida. Y a partir de ese momento me está sangrando la herida. Oh. She's blind. Okay. And right now you are going to, to watch an example of Seguidilla. Check the, 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 this guy is a machine gun. Oh, sorry. <laughs> He's improvising all the time. Well, this is the Seidilla. He is an unbelievable poet, and uh, it's very difficult to do it because he has to to rhyme the music all the time, and uh, it's like a machine gun. It's uh, one verse, and then comes the other, and he has to think really fast. This is a very difficult style of music. And then we have in the central part of the island we have the punto central. Uh, the punto central. Uh, the main characteristic of the Punto Central is that it's attached to rhythm. So they don't stop the musicians. So there's a rhythm. And then the singer is improvising all the time. Sometimes there's an interlude in between. Sometimes don't. This is the Punto Fijo. And then we have the tonada con estribillo, tonada with estribillo, or tonada con estribillo, which is the name, uh, the proper name, where there is a, a kind of estribillo, one ostinato, 
in between the verses. Uh, and this is the tonada with the three, which is a characteristic of the central part of the island. Then we have the tonada espirituana, where there is a, a counterpoint in between. Uh, is Jacob nearby? No, he's not here. He's a, he's a drummer. Is there any drummer nearby? No, well, it doesn't matter. Okay, and uh, well, the tonada con estribillo and then the tonada espirituana, which is basically uh, in the same style with a, a tremendous counterpoint in between what the singer is singing and what the, what the uh, background is playing. And then we have, we have at the end the punto cruzado, which is uh, a contradiction between the time signature of the music uh, you know that's a myla. A myla means one six eight, one three four. But sometimes the singer is singing uh, three four. Meanwhile, the musicians are playing six eight, and vice versa. So we are going to listen. We are going to see first. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a rhythmic part of the punto central. This is the thing. This is the singer, Tonada Perituana, and then this is the background. Okay, I would like to have a drummer with me because uh, you, 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 you will listen exactly what I mean. There's a difference between both the, the, the pattern that's playing the, the, the background and what the singer is singing. And then we have in the, in the Punto Cruzado something like this. If you have a look, there's a 6-8 uh, on top. And then the third part, there's a 3-4, which is and then 6-8. All right, and then the background is playing. The normal mile, you know, and this is uh, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Big your pardon. Okay, play, play the clave of the uh, Punto Cruzado, please. So it's... You see? There's a, <laughs> it's funny, the, the, these old guys were unbelievable, they were unbelievable. Well listen, this is a Guajiro from Miami, he's from the Central Park, are you from Miami, are you? No, 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 no. I wanted to ask you something, you said that then they reverse it too, in the middle of it, they, vice versa, how does, yeah. how does that happen? Yeah, I, I mean that sometimes the, the lead vocals is singing all the time 6-8 or all the time 3-4 depend, depending on the region of the island the region of the country and then the background is playing an old thing so there is a counterpoint it's, uh, it's, it's unbelievable there's one more thing of, uh, about the this uh, Tona Perituana and the, the Punto in the central part of the island always they start singing saying hey it's uh, even, there's a description by uh, several people that visited our country in the past and they used to call this kind of music, hey, because the, the, the Wajiros used to say, hey, and then they start singing. <laughs> uh, it's the same in Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico it's called Lelolai, they say Lelolai, and then they start singing. And it's basically the same thing, and I suppose that in Colombia it's the same thing.
You see, he's from the central part of the island. He's playing with the tres instead of a loop. Bueno, vamos a bailar el zapateo. Ah, ya, yeah, you heard. Hey. This is the ostinato, the estribillo. Hialeah is uh, the more land of we Cubans in memory because it's cheaper. Well, see, this is Domingo Orama singing Tonada Perituana. And uh, I'm going to play you. This is something that we call decima with pie forzado. This means that he, the poet, is given certain verse and he has to improvise a, a, a decima and then the end, the life, last verse, should be the one that's given to him at the beginning. This is punto cruzado with uh, pie forzado. Four stand, is that right? Is it? Beautiful soul, perhaps you have a slang. Que viva punto cubano, listen the guy. Tu vive cucalambe, tu vive cucalambe. Great, 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 unbelievable. This is Pierre Forzal. And then we have the controversy. I told you the controversy. It's too loud. I told you that the controversy is like a fraternal struggle between a couple of poets. There's one that's saying things to the other one and then uh, the other one has to answer. And uh, depending on the quality of every poet, the, the things uh, sometimes can go. Uh, I've seen controversies when uh, I was a kid. Justo Vega y Adolfo Alfonso, they were two great poets. And uh, Justo used to get really angry, but really angry, but improvising all the time, but really, really angry because he was, uh, uh, you know, 
he was older than uh, Adolfo Afonso, and Adolfo Afonso was like a, you know, like a knife with the guy. So, right now, this is something that you have to listen. This is a controversy between Trova Pujareño and uh, Punto Cubano. He's going to sing uh, Trova Pujareño, five verses, and then she's going to sing Punto Cubano, ten. from the central part of the island, but they are singing Punto Libre here. Listen. Translation is, uh, you know, I cannot translate poetry properly because uh, the rhyme, the rhyme. I'm a poet myself, but uh, it is very difficult to translate poetry from one language to the other one. Specifically when uh, we are talking about rhymes in decimas. Perhaps uh, we have to call Pastranic to do it. And then, these are the guys that I used to listen when I was a kid. Still, we do have a program in our country that's called Palmas y Cañas, where you can see these kind of great poets singing controversies.
there are no fighting today. We have been talking about the uh, countryside music, which is the Punto Cubano, and the different styles of the Punto Cubano. The second complex that we do have, and uh, let's say the footprint of Spain in our country, is called the Sun Complex. The Sun Complex, it's the music that we started singing perhaps about the 18th century in our country, is based on the Napolitan song, is based on the Spanish bolero, the Spanish song, and uh, the German song, or the German lead. And uh, it does have all of these in uh, influences. But at the same time, it's Creole. It's absolutely Creole because we added to this uh, kind of music uh, the elements of our work. Uh, let's say uh, transculturation process. So, in the sun complex, we do have several different styles. One of them is called the lyrical sun. Why? Because it's sun that's basically composed by people of uh, academic level. I'm talking about people that normally wrote besides these songs. They wrote operas, they wrote salsuelas, they wrote symphonic music at the same time. And normally the singers of this kind of music are uh, lyric singers. I'm talking about sopranos, mezzo-sopranos, tenores, and uh, baritonos, bajos. I mean, people with musical instruction. Then we do have the traditional songwriting, which is uh, the music done by the people. They use the elements of the Spanish ancestry and, and uh, the elements of the Africans, and they created a kind of songwriting which is absolutely different than the music of the people with the academic instruction, I mean, the people of the lyrical song. Then we have the bolero. The first bolero was written in Cuba a long time ago. It was about the uh, uh, 1880 uh, something, I don't remember exactly the dates, I'm very bad for dates. Uh, it was written by a guy called Pepe Sanchez, who was the, the, the first bolero uh, composer. Uh, normally, the structure of the bolero, as in the all Western music, are two sections A, B, repeated sometimes a couple of times, A, B, and then 32 bars. 16 in A, 16 in B. This is the structure of the bolero. Normally, the, in the Trova Tradicional, we do have several different subgenres, let's say, like Criolla. Criolla has the clave of the danzón that we have heard here before. And then we have the uh, Habanera, which has a clave like this. which is the clave of the tango. And then besides, we have a movement that's called feeling. Feeling was a, let's say, a current of the Cuban songwriter of the mid-40s. The Trova Tradicional is very conventional, 
they don't use big chords, big sequences of harmony and changes of chord, changes of, you know, this kind of things, with the exception of one of the composers. Uh, we're going to play one song of, the, of him. His name was uh, Sindo Garay. Sindo Garay was an unbelievable composer that at the beginning of the century, uh, perhaps he was listening to Stravinsky or uh, Debussy or any of these uh, great composers of the beginning of the 19th, uh, 20th century or late 19th century, but he used a lot in his songs, six and six nine. You know, six nine is a basic chord that you use normally in the first grade and it gives certain things to the music. And he also used minor ninth. Minor ninth is a dominant chord normally over the fifth grade, but it gives a sad, but at the same time beautiful texture to the music. And this guy was writing this kind of music at the beginning of the century. He was very advanced because he never went to school. He was practically illiterate. What was the word? Illiterate. Yeah, illiterate. That's the word. Practically. He learned how to write music, uh, know how to write music, but how to write his poetry uh, alone uh, on his own. And he wrote incredible poetry. Some of his poetry remind me uh, the poetry of the surrealist uh, uh, poets of the French period. Because he said, for example, Las penas que a mí me matan son tantas que me atropellan y como de matar me tratan, se, arro se arrollan unas con otras y por eso no me matan. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to translate that to, to English, but uh, he was so sad that he was killed by uh, his uh, sadness. But because he was so sad, he was so sad that one uh, sadness clashed with the other one and at the end he wasn't sad at all. No, what I mean? More or less, it, this is the translation. Uh, Willie can do it better. Or, uh, or Susan, or these ladies. Well, he was uh, unbelievable. One of the great composers of this period, I'm talking about the lyrical song. This is the music of Ernesto Lecuona. And the singer is Placido Domingo. Now we're going to care. Go on. This is the music of Eduardo Sánchez de Fuentes, who was one of the greatest composers. He only had one problem. He didn't like the black guys. And then, <laughs> at the beginning of the 20th century, he said that the danzón was the most original and important form of Cuban popular music but had nothing in common with the black guys because it was absolutely white music inherited uh, from the let's say Spanish and French people. But he forget something. This is the pattern of the raga from Haiti. It's absolutely Arara music. And this is the pattern of the danzón. It's the alternance between this pattern and four straight uh, uh, eight notes. But anyway, he was a great composer. He wanted to be European, so he wrote operas, he wrote everything, but he's remembered in our country only for a couple of songs. One of them is this one that you're listening, which is called Corazón, Heart, an unbelievable song, beautiful. And you know, one of my goals when I was studying guitar a long time ago was to play this song properly. It's a, it's difficult and it's a beautiful song. But the most important song of this guy was one song that he wrote when he was only 18 years old in the, about the end of the 19th century. It's called Tu, You. 
We're going to listen a fragment of this song. My students are enjoying this kind of music <laughs> with the old videos. They want to kill me. She's an unbelievable tune. It's a great singer. Unbelievable. Caridad Suárez, great singer. Well, ladies and, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there were two, several composers of this kind of lyrical song. We are not going to play all of them because it's going to take too, too much time. And uh, I would like to arrive to Nueva Trova, which is the contemporary uh, form of songwriting in Cuba. Uh, one of the greatest Cuban composers was uh, Gonzalo Roy. Gonzalo Roy had only one problem. He was a womanizer. But he, he was the first one. He created the Cuban Symphonic Orchestra without funds at all. He is in the same situation as my friend Willie, who is trying to organize a cancer. He doesn't have the money. Well, nobody has money in this country, except uh, Donald Trump, I think. <laughs> well, uh, Gonzalo Roy created the first symphonic orchestra in Cuba without funds. And then, it, it was in 1922. He was a great composer. He's really remembered by two of his works. One is the song, Quiere Me Mucho. I think that the translation uh, to your language is yours. I'm not completely sure, but Kira Mucho loved me uh, a lot, adored me, or something like this. And then uh, Cecilia Valdez, which was a, a zarzuela based in, uh, in a novel by Cirilo Villarreal, which is the history of two siblings that got in love because they didn't know that they did have the same father. One was a lady, a brown lady, mulata, Cubana, and then the guy was a, a white guy. They were both uh, sons of a guy called Gamboa. It's a beautiful novel. It's beautiful. And uh, he wrote the salsuela based on the novel, which is very famous. I would like to play the salsuela here. We don't have time to do it. And Gonzalo Roy is one of the legends, one of the glories of our country. Here's yours. It's yours, the translation. He is uh, Alfredo Kraus, but we won't listen to it. The other great composer was Neto Lecuona. And Neto Lecuona is perhaps the most well-known Cuban composer. Today I was talking to my uh, kids about Lecuona. You know, Lecuona was performing, you know, revolutions. The Cuban revolution was very radical. And uh, Fidel, when he got the power, he tried to do everything proper for the people because we were more than 60 years under the foot of the Americans and uh, with a lot of corruption in our uh, country. 
So he tried to do everything good. But one of the things that he did, he made one of the first law was the urban reform. I don't know if this is the proper translation. It was a urban reform where he said that nobody should have more than one house. And then uh, Neto Leguana was performing in, uh, in Spain. He had a couple of houses and he was a legend of our country, a glory of Cuba. And when he got back, he found uh, the, the house closed and uh, a message. Well, Lequona, uh, go to the other house because you have lost uh, this house. It's going to be given to the poor people and Fidel wanted to, to do this. And this was great, but this was bad for some people. And we lost Lequona. Lequona left the country definitely in uh, 1960. And, uh, but this is alive. He died in, uh, in Spain, I think. Yeah, he died in Spain. But he was one of the greatest Cuban composers. He wrote a lot of salsuela, a lot of songs, beautiful songs. He used to have a bunch of singers that used to sing his songs. And then he write the music specially for them. When he wrote, for example, for the, uh, Caria Suarez, he wrote the song specially for her. And when he wrote for an, uh, Esther Borja, he wrote the music specially for, for her. He is a legend of Cuba. Even he created a popular band to perform uh, Cuban music under his name. The name of the band was Le Cuana Cuban Boys. And you can find albums of the Le Cuana Cuban Boys if you go to Amazon.com. Danceable Cuban music. He was able to perform any kind of things. And then he sacrificed his career as a piano player just for the for writing and for composing. He was also one of the founders of the uh, Symphonic Orchestra in Cuba. Without money, he was uh, making roles for the, I don't know what's the name of the instrument here, pianola. It doesn't sound to you? Pianola. It's like a piano, but it does have a roll with holes. And then they play the, with the advantage that you can play piano as well. Mm -hmm. That's what he did. And then he took the money in order to finance and help the symphonic orchestra, the first symphonic orchestra with great musicians, almost unpaid, that we did have in our country. 1922, this is important. And uh, right now we're going to play one song of the corner, just one fragment of this song, which is uh, one of his famous songs, Time in Mi Corazon. But this song is going to be signed by a pop singer. She's not like this anymore. Right now, she weighs about, uh, I don't know, 350 pounds. She lives in Miami. I know, sorry. Listen to a harmony, it's different. I love this chord. Bad luck. She was singing perfectly in tune. 
and then at the end uh, there was a, a small problem. But uh, yeah, she's one of the greatest singers we have had in the in the history of our country. And then. We are going to play one song of the Trova Tradicional. This is the first bolero written by Pepe Sanchez and the, the title of Tristezas. sound like this before. Check the bolero. These are my favorite singers. Uh, this is a concert at Olympia, the Olympia in Paris, Compay Segundo and Mara Portuando. I saw Mara a couple of days ago, she cannot stand anymore. She has to be sitting in order to sing because she's 85 years old. Compay Segundo died at 95 years old in Havana uh, about 10 years ago. And he, he was an unbelievable musician. Omar Portondo, in my opinion, is one of the greatest Cuban singers I've heard in my life. I remember that Ray Cooter, my friend Ray Cooter, he told me once, well, Omar Portondo is the Sarah Vaughan yeah. of Cuba. And I told him, no, you are wrong. Sarah Vaughan was the uh, American Omar in your country. Veinte años de María Teresa Rey. Compay Segundo was completely deaf, so he felt he sings. He used to sing normally in tune because he told me that he felt the bass in the chest and then he could sing because of the sound of the bass in the chest. He was deaf. No, this version is at the Heineken concert in uh, Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. Now I need to work. I remember when we were uh, supposed to play at the Carnegie Hall for the concert of the uh, Buena Vista Social Club 
uh, the his instrument, which is a kind of baroque guitar that he he calls he called harmonico, was absolutely out of tune mm -hmm. because he could he wasn't able to listen to the high frequencies. So because they the instruments it emphasize in high frequencies, he wasn't able to listen. To. And then I told him, well, listen, compai, your guitar is out of tune. Do you want me to tune your guitar? He said, no. Who told you that it's out of tune? This is perfect. There's no problem at all. And then uh, he stopped talking to me because I get angry. I said, well, compai, listen, I'm like your son. Uh, we have to, to tune your guitar, otherwise we're going to be uh, out of tune on stage. And then he got angry with me and he was, he stopped to talk, talking to me for about one hour. We were backstage. And then about one hour and 10 minutes later, he called me, Marquito, come here. Tune this guitar, which is, uh, it is out of tune. <laughs> and he gave me the guitar, we tuned the guitar and then we went on stage. And it was uh, something special. I grew up with him. I was born in Okendo Salud. And then his house was at the corner of Salu with Okendo. And for me, it was a pleasure to work with this old guy, the same as with the rest of the old guys. Right now, you have something that's called Buena Vista here in America, which is not. Because the essence, let's say the dollar, as we speak in Cuban slang, of the Buena Vista Social Club were the old guys. And uh, we don't have time enough to talk to you for uh, longer. There's only one song of the young generation that I would like to perform to you. It's my favorite song of La Nueva Trova. Nueva Trova is a, an old style of songwriting of the 60s, late 60s in our country. It's still alive. There are a lot of Nueva Trova and we have had several generations of La Nueva Trova. The poetry is different. It's not this kind of poetry uh, influenced by the, uh, let's say, the symbolism and this kind of styles of the beginning of the 20th century or the late 19th century. It's more straight poetry, more in the style of the great uh, vanguard poets, European vanguard, European, American, and Cuban, and from everywhere, vanguard poets of the beginning of the century, let's say about 1910. We are talking about food futurism and uh, Surrealism, this kind of stuff. I'm going to, to play you one song, which is my favorite one, by one of the greatest trovadores. The problem that he had is that he left the country in 1980. And uh, there was a, an act, como se dice repudio, Will? act in front of his house. But he, yeah, beg your Repudio. Okay, okay. And uh, he was very sad. He went to Miami, he never made it in Miami. Miami is a different, a difficult place. Uh, we used to say in Cuba that Miami is the cemetery of the Cuban musicians. I don't know why, because it's been a great place for a lot of people. And this is the song that I would like to play for last. Thank you very much for coming uh, tonight. It's been a pleasure. If you do have a question, I can answer the next week. <laughs> this song is called Diario. It's my favorite song. On top of Silvio Rodríguez and whoever. Y confundes la falta de fe con la pena y el llanto que hoy marcan mi cien y entre tantas preguntas llegas a pensar que he olvidado tu beso y tu forma de estar que de nada ha servido perder la belleza de tanto mi Con mis sueños al pairo, así como siempre.
Sigo siendo lo mismo que en aquel entonces. Suena como Jorge Luis Borges, ¿verdad? Perdida, un poco más viejo, no sé. Tal vez más inocente entre las algas y los caracoles. Me hice un amante fiel a mi manera, sin más defensa que las ilusiones. O el vuelo que me trajo una paloma. Abandoné mi cuerpo a la llovizna y he sentido la falta de tu beso. Pero me dio la lluvia una riqueza que tu aliento y tu beso no me dieron. He visto que la flor se muere sola porque siempre le falta. Thank you. 